Okay, well, hi. Um, I know I've had a chance to meet many of you in the last couple days, but uh, for those that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Sarah Maxana, and I'm originally from Chicago, uh, but I've been calling Seattle home for the past 11 years. And I'm a mom to two school-aged kids. Uh, I'm a planner by day for a regional long-range land use and transportation agency, but all opinions tonight here are my own. Um, I'm here as a, as a community member and activist for more housing choices in my city, both subsidized and market rate. And I'm a steering committee member for Seattle for Everyone. And this is a coalition of coalitions that has recently emerged to advocate at the local level and at the state level for these very housing choices. And I identify as an urbanist, and I identify as a YIMBY. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I've been asked to share with you a little bit about my experiences and my thoughts in making the progressive case for abundant housing. Um, but before I do that, um, you can help me out a little bit by telling me a bit about yourself. So who here identifies as a, an urbanist? Okay, yeah, a YIMBY? Yeah, okay, who here is from Boulder? Okay, all right, Boulder in the house. So, okay, Boulder folks, um, here, help me out here. Who here worked last fall to defeat uh, issues 300 and 301? So, for those of you that are out of town, this was, these were the local efforts that would have transferred zoning authority, my understanding, to dozens of neighborhood associations with the presumed effect of suppressing new housing growth in the city, yeah? Okay, so I need a volunteer for a second. Zane, I'm picking you. Okay, Zane, stand up for a second. So Zane is gonna pretend for a minute, because I've got a question for you Boulder folks. He's gonna pretend for a minute that he was a proponent of 300 and 301. Now we know, we know that he was not. We know that he's one of the organizers of this conference, that he was definitely not. But, um, but, tell, me, but tell me, please, um, Boulder folks, did any of you ever find yourself in a conversation or an argument with a proponent of those initiatives and find yourself saying something like this? Excuse me. Don't you realize that suppressing housing in a city, especially a high demand city like Boulder, all it does is it pushes up rents, it pushes up home prices, you know, and it creates these exclusionary enclaves for the wealthy, and it pushes regular people out of the town, resulting in greater social disparity, uh, increased infrastructure costs, irreversible environmental degradation, and fl frankly, you know, flagrant denial of climate change. You know, I want to I wanna tell you something. No, 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 no. Clearly, you do not understand the simple laws of supply and demand. Here, do you see this? This, this is data, and it proves my point. You know what? I think that if you were as smart or as passionate or as morally superior as me, then you would be advocating for housing supply in your city, idiot. Sit down. So now, I have a question for you. I have a question for all of you Boulder folks. All you Boulder folks, um, did that work? Um, so you, I know, there's, I know there's, some, there's some elected officials in the room or former elected officials. Question for you, um, did I just create a safe space for you to step in and, and, and just demonstrate leadership on housing, did I? No, no, that didn't work. But, but data, but I was, huh. Well, shit. I'm gonna have to rethink this whole talk. Um, okay, let me, let me back up and start over again. Um, all right, I'm Sarah. And I'm here to talk with you a little bit about the progressive case for abundant housing, my holla story, or support housing supplies, you lousy hypocrites. The art, the art of crafting winning messages to persuade progressives to champion new housing. Because I gotta tell you, um, for the most part, we, uh, we urbanists, we yimbies, we really suck at talking about this stuff. Um, and we're divided into different camps about it, and we're always arguing and infighting with each other like some liberal circular firing squad fighting over the right messaging strategy. And one camp, one camp over here is saying, you know what? NIMBYs are like climate deniers, and we will never win them over, so fuck them. We need to steamroll them because it is too urgent. We need to fight now, and we need to fight hard. And then there's this other camp over here, and they're like, oh, but NIMBYs aren't all that bad. Um, you know, and some of them, there's this persuadable middle here, and so what we really need to do is give them more information, more data, and then we can build bridges and win some of them over. So which is it? Do we steamroll? Do we build bridges? I know the answer. <laughs> the answer is, the answer is yes. And I'm gonna tell you about that in a few minutes, but first I'm gonna back up a little bit 
uh, tell you a little bit about Seattle and some uh, three things that we're learning from our experience in Seattle. So who here has been to Seattle? Yeah, isn't it amazing? I mean, it's one of these places that I've been there for a decade and I still wake up and I can't believe I get to live there. I can't believe that I get to raise my children in this place. It's got water and mountains and green and even more green and it's got this temperate climate and hardly any mosquitoes at all and there's really good coffee on every single corner and I'm not even counting Starbucks. I love it. Well, so it turns out that I'm not the only one that loves it. Um, in fact, Seattle is one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, with a population just shy of 700,000, Seattle is about 80% of San Francisco, or Boulder times seven. And we have consistently been among the fastest growing cities in the country for the last five years. So here's, um, here's what Seattle's historical population growth has looked like since 1900. And an interesting thing is that right about 1960, you'll notice we dipped. We had a, a, what's referred to as the Boeing bust and a recession, and we lost a lot of population and slowly started climbing out of it in the last 25 years. But it really wasn't until 2010, five years ago, that we hit that 1960 mark again. And since 1910, in the last five years, we have grown by over 75,000 people. That is 40 people a day, 35 jobs every single day. 11% growth in population, 11% growth in jobs in five years. Who the hell are all these people? <laughs> well, some of, them, some of them are Amazon programmers, as they are um, not so affectionately called. Um, Amazon has grown sevenfold in the last five years, and they are, adding a, they are building a new urban campus that could provide space for a total of over 70,000 jobs. And here, Here's my friend, Ben. Ben works at Amazon, and this is his husband, Elliot, and they love living downtown because they can walk everywhere. They moved to Seattle in 2013 from nearby suburbs where they each grew up, and about 13% of the Seattle region's growth is from other communities in Washington State. This is my friend, Mai Tuan, and her husband, Arash, they're originally from California and Wisconsin, respectively. And they love Seattle's neighborhoods, the transit, the diversity of people and ideas. They moved with their young daughter from the Midwest in 2014, and they want to stay. They work at the University of Washington and Expedia, another two entities that are growing jobs quickly in Seattle. They are, about, they are a part of about a third of our recent growth that comes from other parts of the country. This is Deniz. He's from Istanbul. Compared to Istanbul, he loves that Seattle is walkable and that it's not chaotic. He and his wife, Adrian, have been in Seattle since 2013, and they just bought their first home, outcompeting 10 other offers. About 12% of Seattle's recent growth comes from other countries. In fact, Southeast Seattle has long been documented as one of the most ethnically diverse areas in the country, anchored by immigrant communities from around the world. But over a third of our region's growth is natural. It's due to people who are born to the people who are already here. It's us. So here's a lovely lady <coughs> and two adorable kids who are growing up so fast. Um, well, so I moved to Seattle in 2005 with my son and my husband. My daughter joined us in 2006. One new household in Seattle. In 2012, we separated and later divorced growing into two households. Now, if we assume that our kids are going to go on to make their own households around age 20, then we will have become four households. So one household in 2005 becomes four in 2026, a growth rate of 300% in 21 years. So that's what some of Seattle's growth looks like. So for quick context, oh, let me... That's what some of Seattle's growth looks like. So I mentioned we've got 40 new people a day, 35 jobs a day. So what do you think Seattle has been doing to respond to this surge in demand? No, we are growing huge, growing huge amounts of housing. Yes, huge, 12 units a day. 12 units a day in response to this demand. And you know, math, let me see. Um, something doesn't quite line up there. So, do you think we might have a housing supply problem in Seattle? 
You know, we're expected to grow by another 120,000 people and 115,000 jobs in the next 20 years. And I'll note that those projections are conservative. If we keep on the trajectory of the last five years, we will hit twice that mark. So it might not come to surprise, it might not come as a surprise to you to hear that we're having a bit of a housing crisis in Seattle. For quick context, here's how we compare to some of the other areas in the country, particularly some of the cities that are represented here at this conference. We are um, right there, oops. Ah, we're right there. So we're, um, you know, we're not as expensive as San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Boulder, uh, but we're a bit pricier than New York, Portland, Austin. Um, but there's something that's kind of interesting about this. This is just median rents as a snapshot for affordability. When you look at the percentage of change that has happened year over year in rents, the percent increase, every single city was, is, is increasing. But if you notice in the last year, 2015 to 2016, for every single city except Seattle and Portland, that increase got smaller. But for some reason, Seattle and Portland are these outliers, and our percent increase year over year is going up. And so there's a simple truth to all of this that I want to put out there. When housing choices are limited, the wealthy will always win. Here's a less simple way of putting it, and consequently perhaps a bit less compelling, but let's try it. So there is a growing body of evidence that restrictive land use regulations, that is exclusionary zoning, the zoning that prevents the very types of housing types and housing densities that would bring more housing choices into a community, that this exclusionary zoning causes housing shortages in high demand cities like Seattle, like Boulder, like San Francisco. So let me describe a couple of the ways that we're seeing this play out in Seattle. First, exclusionary zoning leads to segregation by class. As exclusionary zoning drives up housing prices with the wealthiest outcompeting others for limited housing supply, it induces segregation by wealth. And over recent decades, researchers have documented how economic segregation leads to disparate access to opportunity. Access to opportunity meaning that some neighborhoods have access to good schools, good jobs, health, mobility, while other neighborhoods do not. So here is a map of access to opportunity in Seattle. This looks like at, uh, a number of different characteristics that lend, it, lend themselves to a neighborhood's ability to provide those building blocks for, for residents to create a successful life, like access to good schools, access to open space. And in this map, the, the blue areas are neighborhoods that have high access to opportunity. The brown areas are areas that have lower access to opportunity. And you'll see that this area over here, this is downtown very high access to opportunity. The U District, where the University of Washington is, high access to opportunity. And then on the near north side, there are swaths, expansive swaths of single family neighborhoods, very high access to opportunity. And then we've got other areas with lower access to opportunity. They include single family neighborhoods in southeast Seattle. And they also include areas on the far north and south edges of the city, areas without sidewalks, less transit, larger communities of color. These are areas that are experiencing gentrification and displacement as wealthier families outcompete them for limited housing. So we have well documented how children's chances of future success, measured by income, measured by life expectancy, are reduced when they grow up in segregated, low-income neighborhoods where they don't have access to those critical social determinants of health and equity, like access to good schools. Which means a child growing up in southeast Seattle, in Rainier Beach, doesn't have the same chance at life that my kids do, growing up in northwest Seattle in a high opportunity area like Ballard. So exclusionary zoning in places like this, on the north end, in those high opportunity areas, what it means is that the wealthy are outcompeting the less wealthy for homes in those desirable neighborhoods, and this is exacerbating segregation by class and race. So what does, what does exclusionary zoning do in areas of lower access to opportunity, those areas in brown? Well, it does the same exact thing. Wealthier folks are able to outcompete less wealthier folks for housing when housing supply is limited. People who are priced out of those higher opportunity areas can go to other places in the city. But for households at the low end of the income spectrum, when they are outcompeted for housing, they're displaced. 
And so exclusionary zoning that doesn't allow more housing choices in our communities leads to economic displacement, pricing people out of their neighborhoods and then out of their cities. And now this is very counterintuitive. And this is probably the toughest sell that we have to make ever as Yimbys, and certainly the toughest one I ever try to make. But adding new supply, both subsidized and market rate, actually reduces displacement. And this is tough to argue because let me tell you, when a house on the corner of my block, a cute little brick bungalow got torn down and two new mansions went up that each sold for a million dollars, that did not feel like it helped with affordability. <laughs> it really didn't. But here's how it did. If only one house had gone up, one house, one million dollar house tearing down that little more affordable house, that would have done nothing, true, would have made the problem worse. But when two houses go up, it takes two households off of that housing market instead of one. That's two fewer households that are out there competing for other limited housing. Adding density is always a gain. Data out of UC Berkeley recently confirms this, finding that displacement was more than twice as likely in census tracts with low amounts of construction than those that had high construction levels. More housing simply makes more room for people. But let me clearly state this. I am not saying that market rate housing supply alone will solve our affordability needs. In fact, let me say that again. I am not saying that market rate housing alone will solve all of our affordability needs. And just in case someone is getting a video capture of this and is gonna show it in Seattle and say, she's a shill. She said that, that we could solve affordability with market rate housing. No, I am not saying that market rate housing alone is going to solve our affordability needs. In fact, that UC Berkeley study found that the impact of new subsidized housing supply had twice the power on preventing displacement than market rate did. But we need the market rate too. There's this really beautiful quote um, that I heard a few years ago. It was former LA director of housing, um, Mercedes Marquez, and she was speaking at a conference in Seattle, and she was confronted by one of our better known NIMBYs who got up and talked very passionately about the very real gentrification and real displacement that he was seeing in his neighborhood, and the development has to stop. And she looked at him and said, you cannot stop the wind, but you can give it somewhere to go. She went on to explain the importance of adding housing, especially affordable housing, to neighborhoods experiencing change, to give somewhere for that wind to go. Because when we don't give somewhere for that demand to go, those with the most money win. And the people at the bottom of the economic ladder suffer the greatest. If we want to grow in an equitable way, we need a lot more housing, period. So in Seattle, we've responded with HALA, the housing affordability and livability agenda. A quick primer on HALA. So in 2014, Mayor Ed Murray and the City Council convened a 28-member stakeholder committee. It included for-profit and non-profit housing developers, business interests, labor interests, advocacy organizations for sustainability, social justice, tenants' rights, other housing experts. These were some of the same folks that had been duking it out for more than two decades in Seattle over policies like uh, incentive zoning and linkage fees. And he basically took them, gave them a year for research, public input, and finally some closed door deliberation, and they hammered out consensus and published a report with 25 recommendations. And one of the things that really set HALA apart from anything that had ever happened in Seattle in the past around affordability, and frankly, from anything that, um, that had happened uh, across the country, is that it embraced market supply as part of the solution. HALA's goals are 50,000 new units in the next 10 years, 30,000 market rate, 20,000 affordable units. The report stated, while funds for affordable housing are key, we also need to relieve market pressures by increasing housing of all types. Now, this slide is ridiculous. There's a lot of little writing on it. Don't try to read it. Um, but the point is that when it was released, Mayor Murray said, we all share a responsibility in making Seattle affordable. And that's the other innovative thing about the HALA report, is that it's not a silver bullet. It's a silver buckshot. It recognizes that we can't just have one tool. We can't just have a bunch of high rises that we smack up and call it good. We need to have 
a policy that affects every zone in the city, provides more housing choices in every neighborhood in the city. From our densest downtown core to our expansive and sacred single family neighborhoods. To ensure, and this was to ensure that we not only build the right amount of housing, but that we build the right amount of housing types, diversity of housing types, and affordability levels to meet our city's needs. The recommendations also touch on the full spectrum of housing issues. So not just the production and the preservation of units themselves, but it looks at the nuances of financing and loans, tenant protections, parking regulations, all of the different components that together contribute to a person's ability to secure safe and affordable housing. Now the cornerstone of HALA, um, oh, there's a page there. Ah. Um, the central element of HALA is the Mandatory Housing Affordability Program. This is an inclusionary zoning mechanism that couples affordability with growth in every neighborhood throughout the city. The program is expected to produce 6,000 units in the next 10 years, affordable units, excuse me, in the next 10 years, and certainly a lot more market rate units. And now taken all together, all of these policies, these 65 recommendations, they're a lot like a tapestry. The members of the HALA committee wove together this suite of policy approaches, tools, actions that taken together address the full breadth of housing needs in Seattle. The individual threads can't do it all on their own. It's a package that works together. Now, I wasn't on the HALA committee. Um, I was one of the people on the outside, passionate about housing and urbanism, really excited to see what the final report was gonna look like. Um, and then the final weeks, it was very hush-hush. It was very you know, closed door. They were hammering out uh, final consensus. And then this happened. So. Somebody leaked a draft document of the report to a columnist at the Seattle Times. And while the phrase shitstorm, I think, captures well what followed, um, in the span of a few weeks, this particular columnist uh, ran a series, not just one, but a series, of opinion pieces lambasting Hala. It's closed door negotiations, in, and in particular, it's bold recommendation that we should dare open up single family neighborhoods to allow duplexes and triplexes. The HALA report was released, because it hadn't yet been released when this all happened. It was released in the middle of all this mayhem, and advocates uh, like myself, we were put immediately on the defensive. But the damage was already done. And the city council members and the mayor backed away from the single family recommendation in order to be able to embrace the rest of the package. This all happened in the weeks leading up to the primary election. For the city of Seattle's, because timing, you know, we couldn't, have, we couldn't have thought this through better, you know? Uh, a couple weeks before the city's first ever district-based city council elections, which meant that every single council member was running for office. Every single one of them. And so very quickly, HALA became the central campaign issue uh, with campaign literature like this hitting doorsteps. Because... City Hall now had a bulldozer named Hala, and it was going to come and raise your bungalow, every single bungalow in the city, really. Now, you know, it would have been really easy at this point for incumbents and candidates to abandon the entire package in, in that firestorm that went on during those few weeks, but most of them didn't. There emerged this pro-housing, pro-equity, pro-urbanism chorus in Seattle. And now that the single-family zoning recommendation was safely off the table, politicians were able to express leadership and support for HALA, even in the days leading up to an historic election. And you know what happened? By and large, the Yimby voice won out. The most extreme anti-HALA candidates lost badly in the primary. And in the general election, we had a result of pro-HALA council members in eight of the nine seats. So since then, the city has staffed up, um, as cities are wont to do, uh, with a HALA support team. And they've embarked on an extensive two-year process to engage the public on how best to implement HALA. Now, a little side note here is that the HALA committee, it was a one-year process. It was a, you know, there was a process there. And um, they had diverse membership and community engagement. Um, but this two-year plan responded to the concerns about the final closed-door aspect of the committee's negotiations. Plus, 
If any of you all know Seattle, Seattle has never seen a process that it didn't want to add a whole heck of a lot more process to. So we've got this two-year process. <laughs> and we've got this two-year process in two-year process to, uh, to see how we should implement HALA. And it was during this time that Seattle for Everyone was born. We came together at first as a loose group of HALA committee members and a community activists like myself, um, organizing in panic uh, as in a response uh, to those first early days as the HALA report uh, was being released, and trying to change the narrative and succeeding in changing the narrative in the media and creating a safe place for Yimby voices in neighborhoods to be heard over the angry vitriol of homeowners. And in the last year, we've grown to a broad and unprecedented coalition of affordable housing developers and advocates, for-profit developers and businesses, labor, social justice advocates, environmentalists, urbanists, all united to build an equitable, prosperous, thriving, and inclusive Seattle. We've helped create over 20 neighborhood level ambassador groups, and we're channeling all of that energy into the city's two-year process so that we can ensure that the benefits of the city's growth are shared by all current and new future residents, from those struggling with homelessness to wage earners, families. And we're grounded in the belief that affordability and growth happen in tandem. Our foundation remains those 65 HALA recommendations, and we are here to work at every level from the neighborhood to the state to see their successful implementation. Okay, so how do we do that exactly? Um, hmm. Well, it takes us back to the beginning of this talk when uh, I was thinking about how to make this progressive case for abundant housing. Do we steamroll? Do we build bridges? No. So how exactly do we campaign for abundant housing? How do we message this story? You know, when you're mobilizing your political base, expanding your coalitions, lobbying your elected lead leaders, um, you need a narrative. You need some sort of story with an arc, and you need to have um, a path so that your audience, you're, you know, you're telling them, by casting this vote or by, um, by supporting this initiative, you get to be the hero, and you get to prevail over the villain. The only problem is, um, who's the hero here, and who's the villain? Because for a long time, Progressives had found an easy villain in landlords and developers. Because, you know, they're greedy sons of bitches, all of them. Um, you know, they gouge renters, they build luxury penthouses. You know, and the narrative for a long time said, if only we could stop them. If only we could have tighter restrictions and regulations. If only we could, we could um, levy more fees on them, then surely good would prevail. But, you know, as it turns out, in Seattle, I don't know about your cities, but Turns out that story doesn't work. Um, you know, what we're finding is that when we stop landlords and developers, that means we get the opposite of what we want. Um, it further restricts housing. It makes housing more expensive. But if the developers aren't the villains, then, well, OK, I guess we need to make them our allies, um, and because they, we need them to build. But who's the villain? Is the villain housing shortage? Because you know, when you're rallying your troops, and you say, come on, team, let's go fight housing shortage. Uh, you know, it doesn't roll off the tongue very easily. So, you know, it's, um, you know, who are the, are the villains then the people in the neighborhoods that are fighting these policies, these tools that would help affluent homeowners the villain? Because, you know, most of us aspire to be affluent homeowners someday. So that, you know, it makes it kind of hard to, to, to target them too much. Um, and is that really a winning argument? If we're hoping to pick up some persuasible, persuadable middle, is vilifying them a winning strategy? Well, we know a couple things that aren't working. We know that you know, spouting off evidence and data, that's not working. Inducing shame is not working. So what is working? What is the new narrative? Here are three ideas. So what is growth? Exactly. Is it cranes? Is it buildings? Is it traffic? Is it congestion? Is it outsiders, invaders, transients? Or is it people, community members? Sometimes isn't it us? So there's an anti-growth activist in my neighborhood who routinely refers to growth as a cancer in our community. Now, I want to think that when she says this, she's talking about the cranes and the buildings. But in reality, 
She's talking about people. And my kids aren't a cancer. We're community members. We're neighbors. And I juxtapose that woman in my community against my daughter. She's 10 years old. She's in fourth grade. And halfway through this past school year, she found out there was going to be a new girl in her class, a family that was moving to Seattle from Texas. And she talked about her for two weeks in anticipation. What was this girl going to be like? Would they have things in common? Would she play with us at recess? And this girl, this new child arrived. My daughter, her group of friends welcomed her. So when is it exactly that we lose that sense of wonder about new people? When do we decide to stop sharing? Is it when we grow up? Is it when we buy a house? When does the convenient parking spot in front of our home become more important than the opportunity to make a new friend? How many of you here have ever been new to a community? Okay. All of you were born once, so I hope all of you raised your hands. <laughs> um, so we need to channel that. We need to humanize growth in our messaging. We need to make it about people. Those images that I showed you earlier, Ben, Elliot, Maitwan, Arash, Dennis, Adrian, me, my kids, we are the faces of growth. And at some point in our lives, we have all been the faces of growth. Second, we need to tell personal stories. I don't think any of us are fighting for more housing because the data say so. We are doing it because we are passionate about a better future. We believe our cities are places of opportunity and innovation, and that they will only succeed if access to our cities is shared across income levels. Now, one of the neat things about telling your story is that you get to decide what role to play. You get to decide who's the hero, you get to decide who's the villain, and you get to decide how good prevails over evil. Is it through steamrolling? Is it through bridge building? But you know, we talked earlier about the challenges in our work, pinpointing a villain. So here's my twist on it. Here's my narrative. This is my hero's journey. Tell me what you think. So I rented for three years before I bought my house. And then after those three years, I was able to afford a house in my own neighborhood on a really beautiful block of brick tutors in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood. It's a very desirable community with good schools, good parks, transit. Commuting time has emerged as the single strongest factor in the odds of escaping poverty. So I mentioned transit for a reason. Research shows that transit access, the personal mobility to be able to reach jobs and services if you cannot afford a car, is critical to escaping poverty. My home is walking distance, easy walking distance to five different bus lines. I can go downtown, I can go to the U District, I can go pretty much anywhere. I can live without a car if I wanted to. In fact, I did for two years when I was still renting. Now, if I enjoy the benefits of that access, my easy commute to work, and then I turn around and I fight new housing in my community that would give that access, that would share that access, with other people, especially to those who might be more transit dependent than I am, then I'm the villain in this story. And I don't want to be the villain. Oops. The one thing rich parents do for their kids that make all the dif makes all the difference. They can buy their children pricey homes in nice neighborhoods with good school districts. You know, access to quality education is the single greatest determinant of opportunity and success in life. And unfortunately, it's one of Seattle's greatest sources of social disparity. And recent research shows that it's one of the best things I can do as a parent. I can buy a house in a good neighborhood with high-performing schools. And yes, that is exactly what I did. I picked my neighborhood because it got my son into, guaranteed my son's placement in a higher-performing middle school, public middle school. Yay me. But if I let my privilege purchase my child's placement in a public school, and then I turn around and fight new housing that would give other kids a shot at those good schools, kids that might need it more than my son, then I'm the villain in this story. 
Yeah, I'm not going to be the villain. So housing prices have gone up a little bit in Seattle recently, uh, as I mentioned. Um, I bought my home in late 2014. 15 months later, I had it appraised, and it had increased in value by over $100,000, nearly 20% in 15 months. What did I do to deserve that? I hadn't put sweat equity in that house. Its, its value had skyrocketed because we have housing, a housing shortage that is driving up the value of all existing homes. And that same phenomenon that's benefiting me is pushing rents up across the city, pricing people out of ownership. So public policy, Seattle's codes and regulations that govern development, is allowing one class of residents, property owners, to profit when those same policies are causing others to struggle. Now, if I allow my pockets to be lined with the proceeds of this housing supply shortage, and then I turn around and I fight the very changes to zoning that would remedy the crisis by bringing more housing choices into the city, then I'm the villain in this story, and damn it, I'm not gonna be the villain. I can't claim to care about economic disparity or climate or sustainability, resiliency, and then turn around and fight housing supply. That makes me the villain, and I am not the villain. I want to be the hero. I want my kids to be able to live in Seattle when they grow up. I want everyone to have a safe and affordable home. I want people to have access to transit, to good schools, good jobs. And housing supply, both subsidized and market rate, and lots of it, is what we need to get there. So that is my fight. Hala in Seattle for Everyone is my path. That is my journey. Will any of you take that journey with me? Here's where I choose the path of the bridge builder. Please, come on this journey with me. But who exactly am I inviting? Who is the bridge builder inviting on this path? Is it the NIMBY? Are we trying to convince NIMBYs to switch teams and join us? How many of you have ever encountered a hardcore NIMBY in a comment thread or, and just gone to battle with them? How many of you have done that? OK, how many, how many did you ever convince? <laughs> no, you know what? We're not making the case to hardcore NIMBYs. We are inviting policymakers on this path, our elected leaders. We are trying to make a space for them to step in and be leaders on these issues. That is our audience. But the question, circling back to the beginning again, what is our strategy? Is it to steamroll or build bridges? Because you know what? I am so sick of the amount of energy that we pour into fighting over this. And I've heard the fight play out in the last couple days, and I've watched it play out for years in Seattle when we just battle amongst ourselves over what the, what, the, what the proper approach is, energy that we could be putting toward affecting policy change instead. But the thing to know is that thing that I did to Zane at the beginning, is that steamrolling? I wasn't a steamroller, I was an asshole. <laughs> that is not steamrolling. Because the steamroller the steamroller is the unapologetic YIMBY who, who fights for our values, holds elected officials accountable, is unwilling to compromise. My story might be the bridge builder's story, but to my steamrolling friends out there, I cannot succeed without you. You push the progressive frame on this debate. You help clear the path to make the bridge builder's path possible. And just as you are the allies, the guardians, the mentors, in my hero's journey, I hope that I may be for yours as well. Because we're all on these intersecting hero's paths. We're all fighting for this greater common good. This belief that Seattle and all cities should be inclusive and affordable, and that our fibers together are more powerful when working as a team than alone. And within this YIMBY movement, there is wonderful, wonderful diversity of thoughts and voices and within the urbanist community as well, within this coalition that makes up Seattle for everyone. 
And it is not only, there is not only the room, but there is the need for us to have different strategies, for the purists to push relentlessly while others are forging compromises to keep the ball moving forward. There is a necessary role for all of us to make this journey succeed. And I've spent the last couple days with you, and I look forward to tomorrow wrapping things up. Smart, passionate, articulate, inspiring people. And I hope that we can all find better ways to listen, to learn, to speak, and to fight for these issues. And I hope that tonight maybe I've provided a kernel or two that might be useful in your journeys. I know that I've picked up some the last couple days from you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.